Hello, football family. Welcome in to Huddle It Up Films NFL Barbecue. That's big board questions. And this time, man, breaking out the big guns from across the pond, Mr. James Ogden. Now, Mr. Ogden, I'd like to call you the hardest working man in show business, but you know, I get a little I get a little defensive when it comes to studying tape. So we'll just see from across the pond, the hardest working man across the pond. And I love saying across the pond because I don't get to do that uh, very much. So how are you doing today, James? I'm good, Jason. I'm good. I'm I'm I, I'm I'm working hard. I am grinding away trying to trying to get my reports finalized. I want to kind of get my uh, my big draft report out to people in a couple of weeks. So uh, trying to get up to over 100 fully finished reports. So I'm getting there. I remember those days back in the 90s in the academy and going through all that stuff. I don't miss that. Don't miss that part of it. Um, but yes, please tell us a little bit or, or a lot bit about your work, because I know you got tons of stuff out there. There's going to be somebody that sees this and is going to find it. So go ahead and give us the rundown. Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter on uh, at NFL Ogden. So you see lots of my stuff on there. I write for Russell Street Report. Um, do the battle plans piece, which is the preview piece uh, before every game, go into depth on kind of it's like three, three, three thousand, three and a half thousand words each week. So you've got to you've got to want to dive into it, but it will give you a real in depth sort of in depth preview of the strategic choices the Ravens might need to make in their game planning that week. I but my kind of first love and like all love is is player evaluation and especially for the draft. So this is my this is my my proper season. Uh, so for for my draft coverage, you can find a bunch of stuff on my site, which is redstarbaltimore.com. Uh, I've got loads of stuff goes up there. You can find uh, on the special Ravens Draft Central pages on Russell Street Report, you can find all of my, well, a bunch of my completed reports. Uh, they'll all be up there eventually, but the first place you'll be able to find all of them will be in my uh, Dra Ravens Focus Draft Report, which will be coming out in a couple of weeks, uh, which has profiles on a over 100 players, uh, has some reports written by Cole Jackson as well, both our friend. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's going to be a big, big beast of a of a publication for people to find out whether these players fit with the Ravens or not and why. I love the player evaluation too. It's something I was attracted to at a very young age. And, you know, a lot of people specialize in coaching and scheme and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you have to know a little bit about that stuff to be able to properly evaluate. But I always want to dig into the traits the person themselves, the fit. Uh, I mean, the talent is always so close, James, that it really it does come to personal preference. And you're going to miss, you're going to swing and miss. You have to learn. Just that whole process I've always been attracted to. But we have a more important question before we get down to business. Now, if you could tell me also where where you're located, you don't have to give me like your street address or anything, <laughs> but where you're located and do, they, do they, you use the term barbecue or cookout? And paint me the picture of the barbecue and cookout in your neighborhood, man. I can't wait to hear. Yeah, so it's definitely not the same kind of same kind of culture in the states in terms of barbecue. You know, I've been over, I've been over a lot and and seen that. You know, walk, I was over last last year uh, in November and you know seeing all the all the barbecue uh, on the on the you know i went to a few college games you know the barbecue near at Notre dame at lsu like it was something else something very different something you just don't see in the uk we definitely barbecue over here it's it's not exactly a <laughs> a favorite pastime of many people usually it happens you know when there's the first kind of like slightly warm day in sort of april time you hear you can smell everybody barbecuing outside and then it kind of dies away a little bit there's definitely not that kind of like communal come and eat barbecue with, with people like that's not as that's not the done thing here but i i do love a good barbecue uh like being you know being over in the states and and tasting it over there is great but you know we do do a bit over here and i i live in uh, a little uh, city called nottingham in the in the middle of the country in the middle of england and uh we have like we have a couple of american barbecue joints in the city which is cool um and you know i've got a barbecue out the back back garden and we'll, we'll go and do some barbecue at barbecue when it's when it's nice so what are we eating though what are we barbecuing <laughs> The main thing over here, really, on the barbecue is like burgers and sausages. You know, it doesn't really go to the 
to the lengths you get in the, in the States. You know, I have tried to, to, to sort of recreate it a little bit, but it's not, it's not great. Uh, the guy you really need to talk to in terms of British barbecue is my, my good friend uh, and the host of the UK Ravens podcast, Gaz Paul. Um, Gaz has got, you know, he's got really good barbecue game. Uh, okay. and I can't wait to get around to his at some point and, and taste some of that. Nice, man. Nice. So just pulled up my big board. We're going to dive in, man, because it's just, you know, you evaluate just more heavily than I do if, you know, if that's possible. So I can't wait to get your opinions. Pick somebody out on my big board, James. Who, who do you want to talk about first, sir? So the, the first guy, I, I kind of don't want to bury the lead because the, the first guy I want to talk about, which I think most people are going to be most interested in talking about is Jordan Davis, uh, who I know is pretty high on your on your big board and he's high on mine, too. I think, uh, you know, t just to start with, I, I felt like when I first watched him, I felt like I had a really good handle on him. I like I put him quite close to the top of my board. It wasn't quite in the kind of top tier the way I grade this. This draft, I don't think has any elite, elite prospects. You know, usually you can find three to five sort of potential all pro guys. I'm not sure this draft has any of those guys. I think it has a bunch of very good guys and I think it has a bunch of depth. And I think Jordan Davis for me is like a, just a tier below those, those very good guys. There's sort of 10, maybe very 10 to 12, very good players. And I think Jordan Davis is just on the cusp of that. But I think the thing with him is I, I just felt like I got a really good handle on him when I first, ta first looked at him. And I just think that the potential there is huge and and the thing that the ravens look for the are the most in players i think at the moment is growth and i can you can see that growth on tape you can see him get better over his years in at georgia and you know we can dive into a bit but you know the uh, sort of the details of what i thought but what i you know what about yourself no i um it it uh it seems like you agree with me because i'm going to put my big board up on the screen here and you can see i had those 10 guys in the dark green did I just think are a tier above everybody? I'm not sure if I totally agree semantically with what you said, James. I think that there are potential uh, superstars. Uh, yesterday, um, we talked about generational talent with with uh, Chris from Deep Cover Pod, and I said maybe generational talent's a strong word, but I do think that you have uh, multi-time Pro Bowlers in this group. Uh, I like Thibodeau. I like Aquanu. I think uh, Walker can be something special. Charles Cross, all those guys in the dark green there, James, I really like. And then, you know, it struck me when, when you said I have Wyatt and Davis right outside that group, uh, right on the target. And there are a couple of questions I have with Jordan Davis. The main one is going to be, James, do you see Jordan Davis as closer to uh, Vita Vea, Haloti Nada, uh, Indomitian Sioux, um, guys that just wreck games or do you see him more in the Vince Woolfork, Brandon Williams mode? And I'm guess what I'm, why I'm asking this is because I really think it could go either way. And I'm trying to put odds on this. Like what are the chances he's, you know, a, just a total game wrecker and what's the chances he turns into a, a very good two down player who controls the run. Yeah. So uh, first, first things first, I think um, just to clarify what I said, I think definitely multiple, like multiple pro bowl guys in this draft. I just feel like there are at times in most other drafts, you can put your kind of stake in the ground on an all pro guy, like a guy who's going to be one of the best in the league. Like a Jalen Ramsey or, a, or exactly. somebody like that, where it just yeah. bam, stands out to you. And I just don't see a guy like that. Like I'm, I'm currently in the process of going through uh, changing my grading system because I, the one I've used for years just doesn't isn't fit for purpose for me anymore. But it's usually I, I grade on kind of like a sixty to hundred type scale, and nobody ever gets near a hundred. Most I've ever really given is ninety six. I often give some like ninety fives all pro wise. I, I don't have any 95s in this class. And I think, I think I'm with you. Like, I think there are, I love Icky. I think he's definitely a potential multiple pro bowl guy. I do love uh, the, the two uh, edge rushers at the top, Aiden Hutchinson, Kevin Thibodeau. Kevin Thibodeau is a bit different. I think Thibodeau has the ceiling to potentially be a, to potentially be an all pro actually. Um, but yeah, so I think I, that's just, just clarifying a bit. Jordan Davis specifically, I think for me, he is, 
Definitely, uh, not definitely. I think let's handicap it because you said percentages. I think 80% chance that he's going to be Vita Vea and not Vince Wilfork. Um, I, I, that's how I that's how I feel with it. I think the thing for me is, uh, and Cole Jackson actually in a group group chat I'm in with with him the other day put in a a, a thing about why why do we project with uh, with Trayvon Walker as much as we do, and we don't project as much with Jordan Davis. Now I'm not comparing the player, and I'm not suggesting that, but the the kind of athletic ability matched to production for the position they play, it, it's the same. Like I can't explain to you how athletic Jordan Davis is, how explosive he is, and how much that shows up on tape. Like, it isn't just measurable stuff. This isn't a guy that isn't doing it down in, down out on, on tape. He he really is. He shows that athleticism. I think you are projecting his past rush a little, but I just think that upside is there. And, you know, for a big guy like that, who you would normally just see kind of barreling into offensive linemen, he uses his hands. Like, if he bull rushes, he can counter off it. He's got, he's got a two-hand shook he's got a swim he's got a, a cross chop like the guy can counter off that bull rush so it, it you know i see flashes of of really good hand usage so i do think he can shed in as, against pass protection there was a guy my mentions recently who said you know when you he can't get blocked I, it was a tweet that dev put out about him not being able to be blocked one-on-one -on -one. And then, and this guy said that he, in the pass protection though, he can't, you can block him with a tight end. Well, I never saw him get blocked with a tight end. And he is a handful as in pass protection too. It's just teams usually chose to block him with two guys. The center usually came across and, and looked to work and he made everyone else better. And he's a force multiplier as well. That's the big thing. Yes, that, that, that's a, that's what you get out of him is that you can't block him one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it's just too, too much. And you mentioned the hand usage. The hand usage is a plus for him. And then when you match that with his explosion, uh, which is rare, 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 it shows up in his relative athletic scores and everything. Very rare for a guy his size. Like he can get an early advantage off the snap on you, use his hands, and then of course has all that force behind him, which makes it, uh, you know, sometimes the guys have no chance. You're, you're going to have to double team him at the next level as well. There's no doubt about it. My main concern may be something you could speak on is that he played this year apparently at 360, 360 pounds, and then showed up at the combine around 340. Numbers aren't exact, but it's something like that. I can't imagine a coach saying, hey, Jordan Davis, you need to beef up. Uh, you know, 340 isn't big enough, man. We need you at 360. So to me, that's uh, that's that's not happening. Uh, he and That's on him. So what are your worries that he can or, – or are you concerned at all about him managing his weight at the next level and keeping the explosiveness that we saw at the combine? And like you mentioned, he showed it on tape at 360. These aren't just hollow numbers. No, and the, the dude definitely showed it on tape. Like I, I, That was not a surprise to me. Go back and watch my uh, preview on two guys watching football of the combine. He was the first guy I mentioned as the guy who would blow up the combine. Like he was – he was always going to do that, and so I do. I do think it shows up on tape. So I'm not too worried about his about his weight. I do have a specific, uh, immediate concern. Like I, I don't think you're going to get the best out of him in year one. I think you're going to some of these bigger, explosive guys like Vita, Vita Vea have, have taken a year or two to 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 kind of adjust and to to find out how they win and have have you know, have then come good after a year. Uh, so I don't necessarily think you'd see the best of him for a year. The, the specific concern I currently have with him for the Ravens uh, is that he he can't two gap yet. So he, uh, he when he's double teamed, he doesn't eat double teams. When he's double teamed, you can put, the reason why teams double teamed him a lot is because you can force him off the, off the point of attack you can lever him away with a double team and um, now obviously it's annoying that you have to spend two guys on him on every play but if you can take him out the play with a double team then there is a there is a path to success he doesn't show yet the technique that you would necessarily expect to see to be able to occupy double teams from a guy that size now it's incredibly foolish to to suggest that he, he can't do that uh, right. like projecting that is something that and in the ravens scheme you know you've we've seen the ravens teach guys how to how to you know 
that technique where they kind of corkscrew the leg, reduce the surface area that the that the drive man has to 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 get into that into them on the defensive line. So you, can, you we've seen the examples of them being able to develop people. Matabike like, comes Matabike. to mind. <laughs> Matabike is yes, a great he was example. he was uh, he was he was overmatched his first year and last year I thought made some great strides in that area and he he needs to if he's going to be you know on the strong side of these runs to be able to anchor better. Um, but yes, you know just for Davis you mentioned the corkscrew having that back leg kind of lateral uh, to just plant off of and maybe just get a little bit lower because Jordan Davis is not short uh, as, as say a Brandon Williams who has that natural leverage. So yes, uh, projecting his run defense, pretty darn easy. I think he'll be able to two gap. And like you mentioned, I agree with you. His pass rush may take a year or so for him to really get comfortable and learn stuff from the NFL, the tricks of the trades with the competition level going up because he's just such a better athlete than the guys even in the SEC that he was going uh, against, which is scary. So I want to talk about his running mate, Devontae Wyatt, who is a guy, as you notice, James, I had very high on my board. I could flip-flop Wyatt and Davis all day. I'm choosing Wyatt because of his pass rush is, for me, easier to project. And I heard concerns, James, from people that I've reached out to, uh, people that uh, – know what they're talking about is all I really want to say about it, who say, well, there's never been a pass rusher with his arm length and his size and his build that has been destructive pass rusher from the inside. And that really is the only argument that I've heard that sticks with me because when I see him, he is just quicker than whoever you put him up against. And he has a litany of moves that he likes to string together. I love how he hand fights. He'll try to cross chop. Maybe he'll club you and then it'll turn into a club spin. And he is just, I mean, he might, he could go two gaps over if he wanted with that thing uh, on stunts. I could see him causing just a ton of havoc. Uh, I want a dis disruptive force in the pass rush from a front four. And I think that if you paired, um, Devontae Wyatt and Matt Abike together and played more of an even front where they could just shoot the gaps and go. I think the Ravens could really have something with Devontae Wyatt. So go ahead, give it to me straight, James. Am I too high on Wyatt? Where would you put him? Uh, Wyatt versus Davis, even take it any direction you like, sir. I've been on a bit of a journey with Wyatt. I think uh, I, I would, st I would still go Davis just for the potential upside it's close though, especially with the Ravens, I think needing an immediate contributor uh, this year. The, so with Wyatt, that I'm with you, that the, the crazy thing is his bend. You know, he can, you can stunt him outside or line him up, up outside and he will bend the edge against the tackle. So his body control, his flexibility, it's just, it's incredible for a man of that size. Uh, and that's something that he has up on Davis. And I think you're right, his the way he strings moves together, his counters, just that explosive ability. Like I he's obviously Davis is explosive, but Wyatt is Wyatt is really explosive. Uh and so he's he's a really fascinating discussion. The thing, the thing that I saw was I felt more stout guards were able to to use their play strength against him. So I felt like he couldn't he they could stalemate him and he had less success against those those stouter guards i think uh, i think he also doesn't necessarily uh he also doesn't show the technique to be able to occupy double teams but i think you're right so i do think it would need to come with a scheme change in the way that the way that you've said i think i would be less comfortable projecting him to be able to to two gap which is why i think as you say it might be better to come with a kind of even front the other thing I, i've talked with that uh, with michael crawford about is, is maybe you know you you run a bit more four three under which i know that the the ravens do a bit which if people aren't aware is a front that a lot that sort of basically allows the three technique to be the star of the show. You know, it gets the three technique one-on-one -on -one matchups. Now, he, the three technique has to win those one-on-one -on -one matchups consistently for a 4-3 under to work. But he he does like he those when you get him one on one. This was why that Georgia defense was so good because they had to block Jordan Davis with two guys. It left Devonte Wyatt one on one, and he just won all day. So that's the thing that you would want to do. You want to if you get him into your scheme, you've got to. I think he's he's a special enough player that you would amend you would amend that scheme to be able to get the best out of him. And I agree with you. I think you put it pairing with Matabike. It's a it's a pair of really really difficult uh, interior defensive tackles to block. 
Yes, his style just reminds me of Matabike. I would just say that uh, a better a better prospect version at this point in his uh, in his career than Matabike was because yeah. I didn't see the fit for Matabike here as well early on because of the two gapping. I faded him down my board and figured, well, one of these other teams with a better you know or the better fit that fits them will take him. Surprised he was still on the board in the third round when we got him. And, uh, you know, obvi- I think his first two years have been a success. I would have liked to seen him play more last year. Uh, one of my bugaboos with the coaching is why is this man playing 40 percent of the snaps, 20 snaps here, 25 snaps there. Just let the kid play. But um, but yes, if 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 Meta BK can improve in the two gap uh, in two gapping and anchoring, taking on double teams, I feel like why it can do that, too. Um, and the, Ra- and and the Ravens, ahead. I was going to say, and the Ravens are, uh, have shown a propensity to do that. Like it's had some mixed results, but they, when it, when a defensive tackle like, like that slides enough and gets to a point where there's value, they will just pull the trigger and, and figure it out later. They did it with, so they, they obviously did it with Madabike and that worked out really well. They did it with Timmy Jernigan and it didn't work out quite as well. So they have shown that they will take a guy when the value is too good to pass up. So maybe if there's, I, I don't think they take him at 14, but if there was a trade down and then he became someone who slides and slides, I think he would, you know, he would definitely be a, be a, a, I pick that they'd consider. Yes. I mean, I feel far apart on Wyatt from, from the rest of the analysts because a lot of people have him going in the twenties, late twenties, even. And I just, I think he's too talented for that. And one more thing on the scheme fit, isolating that right guard against your three tech seems to be becoming more of the norm in the NFL. I don't keep up with other teams as much as I keep up with the Ravens, but I can tell you from Ravens experience, Kevin Zeitler was asked to take on one-on-one some of the best three techs in the league. And, you know, while we needed help on the left side, so I can see the game tor- turning towards that awesome discussion on David Davis and Wyatt. Who else, we, who else can we talk about James? Let's go in depth on somebody else. So I think let's go, let's go Garrett Wilson, because, you know, we talked a bit about Wilson offline. I think. Yeah, so, I need this one. <laughs> so this one will maybe disagree a little bit. I, I think, uh, so I, I love Garrett Wilson. Uh, I I would take him at fourteen uh, if if the board is decimated and uh, you're 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 staring down the barrel of no edge rushes, no offensive tackles still on the board. Maybe you're not as enamoured with the corners that are left. You know, doomsday scenario. I would take him. Uh, I, I, it's a struggle because I think he's probably his game is quite similar to Bateman, uh, but I, I just think the the ceiling with Wilson is 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 different. I, if we want to get it, let's 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 get into the things that that I think are really good about him. I think you know he's got a very varied release package uh, when he's facing when he's not facing a jam. Uh, I think he. Sorry, go on. Were you going to say something? I was going to say press press coverage is one of my one of my questions for him. And the other thing I'd like you to address is I oh I see yak yards after you know run after the catch that kind of thing attached to his name in the first sentence or first two sentences. And to me, this is where I, this is where I'm disagreeing with, with everybody. And I would like somebody to sell me on it. I don't see a super elusive uh, wide receiver. I see a wide receiver who's elusive among other wide receivers, but not a, a total make you miss guy. I'm not sure that that translates to the NFL to where he's just breaking off corners and safeties and taking a 20 yard catch, uh, you know, 80 yards for a touchdown. So yes, um, getting off a of press and and run after catches. The two things I want you to to sell me on here because I want to hear it, man. Yeah. So for me, get so th- there's there's definitely the two the two phase question for me. I don't think he, if it's sh- soft shoe press and they're not jamming him, it's different. Like his his footwork at the line of scrimmage is exceptional. Like uh, he's he's he he has a deadly double move off the line of scrimmage that will just will just just freeze defensive backs. Uh, the, it's a little bit different when 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 you get a defensive back with with potential to put hands on him uh, and to to jam him at the line. I think that's different. I th- I think what I saw was a potential to release around more patient cornerbacks, like those guys that sort of were were patient with their hands, waited, and uh, he he was he wasn't as good at replacing their near hip with his with his inside foot. So he he did release around a little bit when that happened. 
so he can get sort of bumped off his off the red line a bit. So like there is there is a, a concern I think for me with with him getting off press uh, with a jam, uh, but he his footwork is so good that sometimes you can't touch him. He, um, so I think he will have to get he will have to get a bit better at that. But I just I saw a guy who competed there. The run after catch thing. So I I deliberately don't look at stats before I before I evaluate players. Me too. And so when I when I first looked at him, I didn't look at didn't look at any stats. I don't look at anybody else's evaluation before I evaluate a player. I always do it do my watch first, do write my report first, and then I might go and look at some people I trust. That's right. And I, I so for me, the run after catch wasn't an issue and i came out of the evaluation just it, it didn't it did not be it was not something i was concerned about now it may be that i watched the right games but i saw i saw a guy who wins with speed i saw a guy who wins with elusiveness so i do see a change of i do see plenty of change of direction shake yeah man. I, and like i said that double move off the line of scrimmage tells you that that like one of the things the scouting academy you know you've got to look for consistencies in a game and to me like he can he's got a he's got a vicious rocker step on on his vertical cuts when he can just he can put guys miles behind when he's running posts and corners and so that change of direction to me translates to to run after catch some things that potentially like potentially were a problem with him in run after catch he was he was a little bit indecisive at times when he was when he was um trying to get yards after the catch it was kind of like he'd take it he'd think oh i could go this way could go that way could go this way and he and then eventually he just got tackled there was a little bit of play strength t- at times against stronger corners but that's the most important thing i think when you're evaluating a player is to watch like wh- who who is he beating and who isn't he beating mm-hmm. now bigger safeties can get into the ground However, I also saw him stiff arm guys. Uh, you know, I saw him beat guys with with play strength. He is tough, man. Like, I, I, like I, he has plenty of physical toughness. There's he he has that attitude to him. So I didn't see the run after catch as a problem. If people want to be convinced by the run after catch, I, I was thinking about this a lot from when we talked i think go and watch the purdue game first now granted it's purdue so it's the, you know the level of competition isn't as high but he takes an end around uh with speed and elusiveness on that he takes a wide receiver screen uh, a good 10 12 yards and shows you shows you some more elusiveness i think there's lots of good examples in in that game there's a there's a catch down the middle as well then i would go watch the michigan state game and watch him compete with physical toughness against michigan state dbs like you can see him guys bounce off him he's you know he's he's you know he is tough and then go watch the michigan game and you'll see some examples of play strength where he drags two or three guys al- along the field so i do think he can do it I don't think he was especially productive. I think that you know when you look at the stats, it isn't he isn't a especially productive yak guy. But he's a guy who is just like he's making catches ridiculous, like catches he has no right to make. His his body control and his hands and his contested catch is is just phenomenal. So when he's making those catches that he has no right to make, often he's got no chance of yak because <laughs> he's making these ridiculous catches. Yes, that's and, how the numbers get de- deceive. You know, they can deceive you. So yes, um, James, I, I wanted to say too, we're, we're nitpicking here because you know I have I have him in London at thirteen and fifteen on my board. So it's not exactly. like, I mean, this is a prospect that I that I do love. I just I see him go. You know, pick five or pick seven. I, to me, that seems a little rich, especially yeah. from a Ravens perspective when we have more pressing needs and the wide receiver class, of course, is as deep as it always is. But, uh, yeah. but yes, Wilson. What I love about him is how he comes out of his breaks. Uh, it's just he just leaves people in the dust, and he plays the leverage game like you were talking about with the foot outside, inside hit, all that other stuff. But uh, when I see the yak, I don't see that. Like, you uh, you know, Ravens fans, Lamar Jackson's obviously the king of it, where he's making somebody miss, but he don't. he's not even paying attention to the guy he's making miss. He's looking at the next guy he's going to make miss in this, like, Einstein type of football way. And, um, you know, that obviously Lamar is special, special, special. I just don't see uh, Wilson using his leverage and having – maybe it's because of vision because we both agree he's got the quicks for days, man, and it shows – 
coming out of his uh, coming in out of his breaks. Now, the other question, nitpicking again, we we love both love this prospect, but um, when you watch him and you watch his teammate Olave, completely different styles. Olave is Mister Smooth. I call him Rico Olave, which is a Rico Suave reference, uh, old '90s one hit wonder. Not sure if you're familiar with that song. Uh, we use the song loosely, but um, yeah, Rico Olave. Wilson's the opposite, and I think that uh, like a coach like Keith, Keith Williams uh, and an NFL caliber, really good wide receiver coach, will try to take some of the frenetic action out of Wilson's game because I think he wastes some of his movements being a little too frenetic and all over the place. Do you see that, and do you, do you agree with me that that's something that's kind of easily coached? Yeah, I, I I do see that. I do think I do think you I do think you can coach that out of him to an extent i think i would also say that some of it is his like is a little bit his natural style i'd be careful about how much i coach that out right don't take the dog out of him right yeah there are some there are some parts to his game where i do think he's aware of of how he wins and I, I think he can set guys up with with his processing i i, I try and I, I, the uk ravens guys uh processing they, so, yeah, I go processing, processing. I can't quarterback and quarterback is also another one. But anyway, he, I think he wins with his with his processing, processing. Uh, and so I do think, I, I, you know, he, he'll get in a, you know, if he's facing off coverage, he'll get in a DB's blind spot and then use that that suddenness explosiveness, which can sometimes be a little bit jerky. Um, but I think he uses it to his advantage quite a lot. I love Olave as well, man. I, I just, he's so, I agree. He's so smooth. Uh, and, you know, I see, I, I see, you know, I see the fantasy community being a little bit low on Chris Olave. And I'm like, really, man, like this, this guy's, this guy's going to be great. He's so smooth. There's something about those wide, uh, Ohio State wide receivers where they all come out and they all, like, I mean, this is a compliment. They all kind of look the same. Like, their styles would be different, but it seems like they're all about six one, six foot. They're all about 200 pounds. They all can run routes. They all got some yak. They all got some dog in them. I mean, yeah, so you can't go wrong with Ohio State uh, wide receivers there, James. Hey, they, and they've got two more too. So Jackson, Jackson Smith and the Jigber is going to be the next guy off the production line. Uh, and also they have Marvin Harrison Jr., who is Marvin Harrison's uh, son. And he, man, he went off in the Rose Bowl. He's, I think he's going to be a very good player too. So they've got two more on the production line. Got some of dad's good genes in there. That's awesome. So I want to move further down the board a little bit. Uh, a guy, I'm wondering how you feel about uh, Roger McCreary. Now he's, you know, man, ton of experience. You know, and when you have a ton of experience against best college receivers, you're going to take some losses. So you see some losses in there. You see a lot of wins in there. You see some good. You see some bad. But overall, I love this player. I have him at 28 on my board, not counting quarterbacks, by the way. So, of course, you know, you throw a few quarterbacks in there. He's, I'm looking at, you know, 31st or 32 on my board. Um, but, yes, McCreary would love to hear if you think I'm a little high on him. Or if you if you love him as a cornerback as well, yeah, I love him too. You're definitely not too high on him for me. In fact, I I'm a little bit higher. Uh, when okay. when my board finally shakes out, I'll be a little bit higher than 28. So uh, I love him, <laughs> I really do. And maybe he's gonna maybe he's gonna teach me a lesson uh, in a few years. And you know, he's not gonna work out. And uh, I'm gonna have to take take my medicine on. on you know, a, it happens. On, <laughs> So, okay. So he's too, sh- like, here's what, you know, he's too short. Um, yeah. You know, he's got some bad reps on tape. He gets over aggressive. Uh, aggressiveness is also, he only runs a four or five. So these are the things that people are concerned about that I'm not. So go ahead, James, you take it for me, bro. Yeah. And so, and the big measurable thing that, that you can, you can be at, like a little bit concerned about, let me just check. Cause I got this up before he has uh 28 and 7 8 in, inch arms like he has less than 29 inch arms so that's the big thing that people are concerned about and so i'll talk talk to that a little bit because he he does have lack of length so i just felt like i think sometimes you have to sit back and watch a corner and say like is he good at the primary job of a cornerback and the primary job of a, of a cornerback is mirroring a wide receiver in a combined area to prevent the quarterback from targeting him like that is the job of a of a cornerback in in a nutshell. He does that. 
does that so consistently well, especially in confined areas. You know, he there he is smooth. He's methodical. He he has I think he has really good technique. Uh, there is very little wasted movement in, in both his drive mechanics and his transition mechanics. Uh, like he. <sighs> And then we get into the stuff that that I love. So one of the one of the concerns around his length would show up in his ball skills. He has, frankly, he has. I think he has one of the. I think he has some of the best ball skills I've ever graded on tape. That's how good I think his well, ball okay. skills are. He his timing, his placement of his hands. He is so good. Like he got. I think didn't. I think he got his hands on fifteen balls this year. Um, which is crazy pro ball production and uh, not a great deal of interceptions, but the guy just breaks up passes for fun. Uh, he is competitive. He's so competitive. Like if you're not sold on him, go back. I know this isn't for you, Jason. If, no, if, go, if, I think we if need the games. Out, if people out, aren't sold him out there, go, he plays, he, he, you can go and watch him play Jamar Chase. Like, go and watch him cover Ch Chase. Like, he, yeah, he loses some reps because everybody loses some reps against Chase. But he competes in that game. And that was that was three years ago. The kid has developed since then. You can see growth in him. So I, I, re I really like him. I think there are clearly some, some concerns about him. I think the length does show up sometimes in press with a jam. Like, I think sometimes he, he struggles with that. He's got much more patience over his time at Auburn with his hands in, uh, when he's when he's impressed. So I do think he's improved, but the length sometimes shows up. The length deficiency sometimes shows up there. I, I think... I think I think you're right. I think his angles can sometimes be a bit of a problem. Uh, so I definitely saw that on tape too. And, you know, he isn't explosive. That's the other thing that is a little bit concerned of a concern you know like i said that he's smooth he's technically proficient he's got great processing he's 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 a he's a really intelligent football player but you do see that lack of explosion when say he's in off or he's in squat and he's covering a hard angle break he, and he gives up a little bit too much cushion he doesn't quite have the juice to be able to get to those to get to that so there are going to be some struggles in that sense but he has enough speed and he wins with his processing and his technique, which means he has great play speed um, as opposed to his to his measurable speed. So I just, I love the kid. I think he competes. I think he looks like a Raven. He's, ex he's, he's so willing in run support. He's tough. He's just, he's a guy I really like. Me too. It, you know, I think that he would fit perfectly on this team. McDuffie's a guy I'm high on as well because I see both as, don't worry about the wide receivers that he would struggle a little more to cover. Think of all the other receivers, which is probably 90% of them, if not higher, that he's going to be able to lock down. And you mentioned his, you know, okay, well, at the catch point this, the catch point that, good luck trying to get to the catch point one time uh, with Roger McCreary because he is going to disrupt you somewhere around that route. I mean, it looks like he's the, the receivers are stepping on his toes because he's so far ahead of the game. So sticky. And then, you know, when you talk about his run support, something the Ravens love, something I love, something I think is really necessary if you're going to cover receivers in and around the box, that you better be willing to be the first man there uh, to fill a hole, have that good eyes and instincts. And for a guy who runs a 4-5, which obviously I don't put a ton of stock into the 40, uh, he sure does know what's going on and play fast. Like the game seems to move very slow for him in his head it has nothing to do with speed it's just a player with good eyes instincts who's seen it all so uh like i said you know you can be you can have a receiver that may be have be physically superior longer taller maybe even faster um but they like say good luck when it comes to technique and getting rid of this guy because he's in your your hip pocket uh an aggressive style corner love mccreary so james i know uh you know I'm surprised you haven't fell asleep on me, man, because of the time difference <laughs> over here. But, uh, no, it's cool. man, I got to ask you about one more. I think this is a guy we agree on. Now, he's my <laughs> positional favorite. If you look at the board, I have him at number 34. And when I do pro pro positional favorites, James, uh, Michael Crawford mentioned where Chris was talking about Michael Crawford as his great value pick, kind of the same meaning. It means that I believe in this guy more than I see others in the scouting community believe in him. 
And with Quay Walker, uh, it takes a while for, because the Georgia defender, uh, all the Georgia front seven are just so dominant. And you're like, oh, yeah, Quay Walker, another tackle. Well, geez, he's got Jordan Davis in front of him, of course. But it took me a while. Um, but his eyes to me, you talk about a man who's a, uh, ahead of the game. He can shed a block, like we're talking about Lamar and his running ability, making somebody miss without looking. He can shed a block or maintain a block and still be it, keep his outside shoulder free, as well as I've seen, and keep eyes on the ball carrier. He is not – he's looking right through the guy who's trying to block him and looking at what's happening in the backfield, looking, watching the holes develop, open and close. Uh, Mike Linebacker, to me, all day, a guy I would love to have in the middle of the defense. So let's talk about his positives before I bring up any – uh, concerns that I see with them. Yeah, I, I I'm that right there with you. I think that the I mean, so that Georgia defense, someone's going to be, someone isn't going to be good in the league. They can't all be good in the league because someone was, uh, someone was helping someone else in that defense. So there's there's like there's someone who wasn't as good. But I, I love these I love these linebackers from Georgia. I'm not as high on Nagobi Dean as as some others, um, but I. I really like Channing Tindall as well. I just did Channing Tindall's tape uh, the other day, and I really like him too. But physical Quay Walker, guy, physical, physical guy, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, but Quay Walker is different, man. I, I just think he, he. I completely agree with you in terms of his in terms of his processing. I think he he's he just he he sees stuff coming really quickly, especially against against both basically. I think especially against zone, but I see it against gap too. You know, he he's able to to read those read run really quick read run pass really quickly he will diagnose those runs quickly he gets himself in position but uh, and kind of matches angles with offensive linemen but like you said I, you know it's his ha it's his use of hands like he he can leverage his gap and tackle the runner in the gap with no problem whatsoever uh, and I, I you know i'm so impressed with his physicality and his play strength and his processing i i completely agree with you i think i think he's a i think he's a mike uh, i think I think the the other thing is, I was, I wondered whether he was a little bit a little bit speed deficient. He is not. Like he's, he, I think what did he, I think he ran a four five, uh, um, which is which is really impressive. Uh, and he yeah, has four five two, four five yeah. two. Yep. And he has some explosion to him as well. So I, I just think this guy is, you know, we can talk. A, I think, I think he's, I think he's a great fit for the Ravens because I think one of his deficiencies is his zone coverage. Uh, I think he, he's he, in man to man. You can trust him to cover tight ends, running backs, no problem. Sometimes you get a, a sort of quicker slot receiver who can who can set him up and beat him. But like, I'm not that worried if you if your Mike linebacker can't cover a. Uh, you know, a, a really quicker than fast, high processing slot receiver. He's not going to be asked to do it that often. So, you know, I think he's, and, and to be fair, he can even cover those guys, if I remember correctly, with his uh, with his play strength. So the only times those guys kind of got away were if he didn't get the chance to be close enough to be in phase to use right. his play strength. So like you, there there are even circumstances where he's going to cover slot guys too so i do think there's there's a there's a lot to lot to lot to work with there i think I, i'm surprised where i see him potentially going like it seems like he's available in the second third round i i, I just think i would i would at best yeah at worst i would take him sort of back at the sort of top of the second so i think there's definitely some there's definitely a lot of upside there. The the only thing I said, like like I said, I think there is a there is a slight challenge with him in in zone. But yeah, what did you see in terms of his areas for development? The same thing. It, it's it's zone coverage. He he seems a little tight hipped. Um, just even watching field drills and that kind of thing. You just watch for it on tape. If you have a concern, I'll I'll look for that specific quality even when the play is away from him. Just to see how he moves. I do think he's a little tight hip. If you're asking him to cover a lightning bolt. A uh, quick receiver in the slot. Yes, he, he's going to struggle with that. But for, let's face it, James, um, projecting coverage abilities for inside linebackers is one of the hardest things, at least for me. We see some guys get it, pick it up pretty quickly. You see other guys that are just not going to get it. But what gives me hope with Quay Walker is he sees the field really well, uh, regardless of situation. It helps him. Like, I thought his play speed was – I wrote down good enough when I when I first watched it. He's not a blazing linebacker like a Patrick Queen, but he's got enough play speed to chase you down on the sideline, especially if the other players are doing their job and kind of stringing them out. 
But, um, yes, a little tight hip. And, of course, coverage is always a projection. Um, I saw, you know, I saw some good and bad in there. So projecting that is, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say it's holding me down. I, I have them very high on my board and my positional favorite. But it's always going to be a projection. And um, drafting an inside linebacker that early, like if, if he fell to pick 45, I would be fine with it. But uh, if we were sitting in the 20, 25, 26 range, I might want to go for another position and not invest all that draft capital into inside linebacker. So, um, yeah, what, what else do you have on Quay? Because I know you know you're up against it a little bit. Yeah, no, that's fine. I think with with Quay, I think yeah, the the zone coverage for me. What I saw, I definitely saw the the, the tightness. I think the other thing I saw was uh, he didn't he didn't necessarily perif receivers particularly well. So there was there were times when if if you flood his zone, he he had a he had some trouble. Uh, so I, I'm not. I, I think he definitely. It is definitely a projection in terms of coverage. But like you say, it, you know, it's really difficult to project that to the next level. I do think he's he's got a. I think he's got a great chance. I'm with you. I would definitely take him at 45. I probably wouldn't take him if we were if we were picking slight. I, I would probably pick him a little bit towards the top of the second. But I also don't like you say. I don't want to invest too much. The the thing I would say, I think for the Ravens though, is I, I do. They are missing. Uh, like it, there's no coincidence that, that it's not a coincidence that they were chasing hard after after Bobby Wagner. They they are looking for a good coverage linebacker, and I'm not surprised. You know they they've they've when you look back to the 2019 defense, which I think is was the closest to what they wanted to achieve from it from a defense. You had Earl Thomas back there as the as the free safety. Uh, and you had you then had less linebackers on the field, but you did have one on that always had, that that really could do with being a good coverage linebacker. And uh, they've 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 plugged the, the the single high free safety problem with with Marcus Williams. I think they are looking for a guy that can play every down as a Mike linebacker who can cover. And I don't think they think that's Queen. Uh, and so I think that I think they are on the lookout. And so it would be no surprise to me if they took a guy like Quay Walker. I also like Devin Lloyd for that as well, but won't be able to get Devin Lloyd. I don't think unless we take him at 14, which is probably not. Uh, there are other pressing needs probably than that. But yeah, I, I really like him for that position. It would be great if they could um, if they could get him. I would run the card up at 45 if he's there. So, James, one last question before I let you go. Uh, I mentioned today, I mentioned yesterday when uh, when I was with Chris and maybe with Dev, I'm not sure, but I have 72 guys there in that orange section that I'm giving a second round grade to. And I mean, even with those guys, James, I'm trying to be extra stingy and, and talk myself into now nah, you're just giving too many guys second round grades. But I really feel like what happened last year with COVID and the restrictions and so many guys, you know, waiting to this year to come out that that's why I have 72 guys with a second round grade. I mean, James, I'm usually lucky to get to 50. Like, are you seeing the draft the same way with, um, you know, are you seeing it stocked in that, that just like second, third round, even going into the fourth round, you're going to get guys with second round grades. Yeah, I see it exactly the same way. I, it leaks. It definitely leaks into the fourth round for me. You know, there's that that top 100 this this year. It's extended beyond that, and I think you know you're gonna. And with the way teams draft as well, I just feel like it's even towards the end of the fourth round, you're gonna end up getting a guy that in previous years you might have taken at the back end of the second. You know, this that's the kind of talent in this draft. That's the area. So I think they love that they've got that they basically own the fourth round because they can wait for teams to make mistakes. They can wait for teams to overdraft guys and then take their guys in the fourth, which I think is where the probably the tear break starts to happen. I think you've got a chance to possibly get some more i think you'd have to go back quite a distance in fo from 14 to get more in the sort of second early third range you'd have to go a pretty good distance back which i'm not necessarily sure they'd be willing to to go that far back um because i think they're pretty close to a tear break where they are in the first so it'd be interesting to see but if there's a bunch of guys on that still on their board that, that, that they have similarly rated there's been, maybe there's been a there's been a run on the guys that they wanted at 14 and they've got a bunch of guys at the same same kind of grade then i can see them dropping back and picking up another pick in the in the second third fourth round range because this talent this draft is so rich that it really is 
you know, when I, I don't do the, I, I hate the mock draft simulators. I think that they are, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, I can it's, rail you can against see where them, they, you, you can see where they have them ranked on the board. And then yeah. you can say, oh, they got that guy low. I can wait for him. You know, it doesn't, doesn't exactly. work like, doesn't that. Work so, like that. Yeah. So I can't get into the mock drafts, not knocking anybody who does. It's just no. not, it's just not my thing, man. I, I just, you know, I try to keep it like, uh, according to my board and just kind of stay in my lane. But yeah, James, I'm feeling the same way. Go ahead, buddy. No, I was going to say, but if you like, I, if you get there and the, and you, if you do it and you get, I, I've done it a couple of times, you get to the fourth round, you're like, man, I don't know who to pick. There's like several options in the fourth where I'm like, I could say, I, I love these guys. This, yeah, this yeah. is what I wanted to say. I could see the Ravens. You, you painted a bunch of scenarios of the trading back when in maybe trading back up for the sweet spot. But I could see it go uh, the other way, too, because the draft is so plentiful. I could see the Ravens trading up this year uh, for a change and just saying, well, OK, we're going to give up this third round pick and maybe a third or fourth next year. Because guess what? We have all these fourth round picks and we're going to have guys rated in our top 40, 50, 60, whatever, falling to that fourth round. So, you know what? we'll give up one of those picks because we know we're going to get a ton of quality players that we normally wouldn't be able to get in that fourth round. So there's an argument to me to trade up to if you really like one of those guys in my top 10, uh, say that are slipping down, you were like, man, I can't believe so-and-so is there. Trayvon Walker's there at nine. Uh, Jermaine Johnson's still sitting there at 11. Now, I don't want to see him get picked. They can make a tr trace to give up one of those mid round picks or maybe two if they had to, because, on draft day price goes up uh, usually and, and really get an impact player that they want early. And then maybe trade back later. If you really need the picks trade back later, because you know, you're going to get guys that will fit your system uh, properly. Yeah. And there's a bunch of teams ahead of them that are, you know, rebuilt in rebuild mode and we'll, we'll be happy to, to maybe drop back a few spots, get a guy of a similar talent level for them, or at least maybe one sl slot below, but then get a couple more lottery tickets. And uh, you can definitely see potentially Houston doing that with them, um, with Casario as the GM. I'm sure he would, he would be looking to do that. So I do think there's a, there is also a chance that they trade up. And I think that they probably feel, I think the splashes in free agency show that they, they maybe feel that they're close and, you know, you get up and get a premium player that's going to start year one, then maybe that's something that they do. And I do think there's, there's a, you know, there is, there is a, somebody is going to drop towards the bottom of the top 10, whether that's a, a Derek Stingley or a Jermaine Johnson, or maybe even a Thibodeau or one of the tackles, maybe it's Charles Cross. There's a chance that one of these really elite guys is going to drop to the bottom of the top 10. It's almost certain. So, you know, <laughs> Definitely a chance right. of trading up too. That's what I'm thinking, James. I think like, I can't rule out anything, but just because of that depth in the middle, like you know, yeah. we could trade back and 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 basically complete uh, com fill out our roster with uh, guys that you can project as starters or at least strong role players. Or we can say, hey man, Charles Cross is on the board and it's pick nine. Let's uh pick ten. Let's go up and get him. Or you know, Derek Stingley, you know, his value is low because of the you know the Liz Frank and you know this and that and let's go get them so um so yes james james i hope you come back on and make time for me later on down the road Definitely. do this again as we get closer to the draft because uh i love it man this is uh we're long overdue and i'm i'm really happy you made time to jo uh to join me today tonight no problem for you <laughs> no problem jason definitely back on before the draft i'd love to all right man i'm gonna hold you to it definitely so with that i'm gonna say goodbye to my football family Thank you to my football family. Hope you're enjoying the series. We're going to have uh, a lot of great guests coming up after James and uh, get James and somebody to double back, a couple people to double back. So it's time to put this content out, man. I was patient enough, tried to get through my evaluations, but I can't take it anymore. Needed to talk some drafts. So, James, thank you so much. And uh, say goodbye to the people for me now. Yeah, goodbye, everyone. Thanks.